Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our, our speaker, Tiffany White. Tiffany serves as the executive director of the Dirksen Congressional Center, located in Everett McKinley Dirksen's hometown of Pekin, Illinois. Everett Dirksen served in the U.S. House and U.S. Senate throughout the course of nearly four decades and was the Senate's Republican minority leader from 1959 until his death in 1969. He's best known for his indispensable role in ushering into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The center is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization with a mission to enhance the public's understanding of Congress, its people, and its policies. Before assuming leadership of the center in 2019, Tiffany served as Chief of Staff to Illinois State Representative Mike Eunice. Previously, she was the Executive Director of Pekin Main Street and served for five years on staff in the 18th Congressional District Office, where she managed immigration and State Department related casework. Tiffany is a 2008 graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a 2005 graduate of Pekin Community High School. She acquired a bachelor's degree in political science and speech communication with minor concentrations in both American history and American religious studies. She's a 2010 graduate of the R. David Tebbin Leadership School, named after her late father and former mayor of Pekin, and is a member of the 2018 class of Peoria Magazine's 40 Leaders Under 40. Tiffany and her husband Ben live in Pekin with her three daughters, Jane, Claire, and Molly. Her favorite hobbies include playing the piano and collecting dresses. <clears throat> it's an expensive hobby. Um, she's an enthusiastic supporter of the fine arts and a devoted member of St. Paul United Church of Christ in Pekin. Her approach to life is dedicated to Teddy Roosevelt's famous saying that the best prize life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Tiffany. And I'm looking at the four-way test that I didn't know about Rotary that you apply to things that you say. And uh, these are wonderful words to live by. Uh, Dirksen had a similar test, I think, and um, it is embroidered here uh, on this. It says, I tried to keep my words sweet and tender because someday I may have to eat them. <laughs> This is a nod uh, not only to uh, Dirksen's temperament, uh, his easygoing and easy to get along with mannerisms, but also his sense of humor. And uh, it has been such a joy for me to um, assume a leadership position at the Dirksen Congressional Center where, uh, among many other things, we seek to preserve and protect his legacy. Uh, this is just a visual of the Dirksen Center, both outside and inside. Um, I suspect that many of you have never been to the Dirksen Congressional Center before, but um, we have a wonderful facility located in Pekin, and um, our mission is to enhance the public's understanding of Congress, its people, and its policies. We are primarily a research institution and to professionals in and Congress and then help the public do the same. We maintain several congressional collections, including that of Senator Everett McKinley Dirksen, of course, but we also have the collection of Bob Michael and Rayla Hood. And some of you may know the name Neil McNeil. He served as the congressional correspondent for Time Magazine throughout the uh, 1960s and 1970s, and he covered Dirksen's career extensively. His collections are widely utilized by researchers who are doing work on members of Congress who served during that time, uh, and so it has become one of our most fortuitous uh, collections. Uh, we also support our mission by offering congressional research grants to uh, professionals in the field. So individuals who are maybe not coming to our facility to do research, but are going other places in the country and need financial support. Uh, we have a congressional research grant program that to date has issued almost $2 million um, in small grants to researchers. 
uh, and it has sustained itself as one of our proudest missions. Um, but again, in conjunction with our mission to help the public understand Congress in general, we have this unarticulated mission to keep the legacy of Dirksen himself alive. And um, I am not an archivist or a historian uh, by trade uh, or by education. Uh, I, like I like, was introduced, uh, studied political science and speech communication, and I've spent the majority of my own career in legislative uh, politics and legislative government. And so those are the skills and experiences that I bring to the table. I'm also a very proud supporter and enthusiast for the arts and the humanities, and um, storytelling is certainly chief among those interests. I think that it is important and pertinent to every aspect of life. And one of the things that I have done with my position at the Dirksen Congressional Center is to join an organization called Illinois Humanities, and they have a Rhodes Scholars program. And I, uh, through that position, tell Dirksen's story, um, particularly as it relates to his upbringing, because I think when we study leaders and anybody who makes a difference, it's important for us to understand not just what they did, um, but who they are and why they became what they became. Um, and Dirksen's story is certainly uh, among my favorites in that regard. So it's been a real joy for me to learn more about Dirksen himself uh, and then to share what I've learned with others. And that is what I'm going to do with you today. Uh, I'll tell you first that we had uh, parent-teacher conferences for my school-aged children last night, and they're both doing very well academically, but they both got uh, a negative mark in that uh, excessive talking category. And after we left the conferences um, 10 or 15 minutes late, uh, my husband's remarks were, well, at least their teachers will now fully understand why they are the way that they are. So uh, I am going to hurry through it. Uh, Dirksen was born in Pekin, Illinois in 1896. Uh, he was born to first generation German immigrants. His mother had been married before uh, to another German immigrant, but he died young after they had two children. And then Dirksen's mother married his father uh, shortly thereafter, and they had three more children, all boys, by the way, uh, including Dirksen and his twin brother. But then sadly, Dirksen's father also passed away when he was only eight or nine years old. And so his mother, again, first generation uh, German immigrant who spoke mostly German and a lot of broken English, um, was twice widowed in the early 1900s and um, raised all five of those boys all by herself. They lived in a part of town among other German immigrants and it earned uh, perhaps the somewhat derogatory name of Bonschwittel, which translates loosely from German into uh, Beantown. And it was called Beantown because of the German culture that the inhabitants carried forth there of growing large vegetable gardens on their own properties. And they even maintained uh, some small livestock as well. Uh, this was not just something that they did culturally, but their socioeconomic status required it as well. Um, this was a group and a class of people that really felt they couldn't afford to buy all of their own food and all of their own groceries. And so they grew it themselves. And Dirksen has early, early memories uh, as a young boy waking up before 5 a.m. to go out and tend to those vegetable gardens because he and his brothers uh, were really instrumental in supporting the entire family, uh, especially their mother. Um, the picture on uh, the bottom is a group of women uh, in which Dirksen's mother is pictured. And this is the group that started the Second Reform Church in Pekin. Uh, they started it organizationally, and they also built 
the church themselves, the physical building. And uh, I tell you this because this is a testament to just how devoutly religious Dirksen's mother was. And this was important to him in his upbringing for a number of reasons. And um, it'll show up again in some of the later stories that I tell, but uh, she came from that old Calvinist background and she raised her boys with uh, a firm but loving hand. Uh, and her faith guided her and also guided Dirksen and all of his brothers. And it just really played a tremendous role in his foundation that, again, comes up time and time again in his life and in his career. Dirksen was the only one to go to high school. Um, it was common at the time for boys and girls alike to drop out of school by the fifth or sixth grade. Certainly, if you came from a lower socioeconomic background, uh, this was just necessary because more family members get to work to support the family. And um, all of Dirksen's brothers did just that. Um, in fact, they eventually started the Dirksen Bakery on Hamilton Street in Pekin, which is no longer there. Uh, but it was the small business that sustained their uh, family for the rest of their lives. Dirksen was a little bit different, however. He um, was born with a gift for intellect. He loved to read. He was a gifted speaker, and um, his his thirst for knowledge was um, present even at a very young age. Uh, and so he really didn't want to drop out of high school, and his mother allowed him uh, to continue his education in part because she saw it as an opportunity for him to go into ministry someday which he didn't do, um, but uh, that was part of the reason why she agreed to allow him to continue his education because she thought, oh, how wonderful it would be if one of her own boys went into uh, the ministry and could uh, sustain the legacy of um, that Calvinist tradition that they had carried over from Germany. Um, and Dirksen got very involved when he was in high school. Uh, he was on the debate team. He played sports. Uh, he got into theater, which became one of his primary loves. And by the time he graduated, he even um, had this idea that maybe he would be a professional actor. He brought this to his mother, who, uh, of course, was very much opposed to it, uh, being the first that she was, and urged him to not pursue a career in acting. And so he uh, being the German son that he was, and instead he connected with a cousin who was going to school in Minnesota and uh, went and explored their law school and thought, okay, this is the career for me. Um, you know, it allows me to continue my education and utilize my uh, skills in oratory. I also think he was drawn to this because he idolized Abraham Lincoln. He saw so many parallels between he and Lincoln. law school and then it was 1918 and World War One broke out and uh, he became conflicted over this because uh, anti-German sentiment was on the rise in the United States. He worried about his mother and he knew that his brothers would not be able to enlist in the war because they were older, um, they had already started families and they were for running the business that was sustaining his family back in Pekin. And so um, he made the decision to drop out of law school and enlist, in part because he really wanted his mother to be able to hang that blue star in her window and say to all of their neighbors in the entire town that the Dirksen family was doing their part to fight the Germans. 
I have to tell you this great story um, related to that uh, about when he came home to tell his mother about this. Um, he comes home, tells his mother what I just told you, and um, it was all fine and well, but Dirksen noticed that uh, she had continued to display a very large, glossy photograph of the Kaiser in her living room. <laughs> And I said, you know, Mother, uh, on the topic of anti-German sentiment, maybe you want to take this down for a little while, just at least until all of this uncomfortable business is over with. Uh, and she got angry, and she refused, and she said, you know, I am still very proud of where I came from, and um, I understand that there's conflict right now, but also I came to America because I wanted to experience the freedom Kaiser is a good family man, and I don't blame him for this mess that all you politicians have gotten us into. Um, and so that was that. She she uh, she kept it up. But I love the story because um, I think come from is something that. He went in life, no matter what status he achieved, he was always so humble and always remembered where he came from. And my experience with um, all types of leaders is that that's essential to um, to being a good leader and to ensuring that you remain grounded and that everything that you do is with good purpose. After the war, he came back to Pekin, not really uh, certain about what he was going to do. Uh, he knew that he couldn't uh, take up that uh, profession in acting, but he could do it as a hobby, and that's exactly what he did. This is a picture of Dirksen uh, on stage at the Pekin Union Mission stage, which is still uh, intact in downtown Pekin, although not utilized anymore. Uh, and it's a good thing that he decided to take up this hobby because this is where he met uh, Luella Carver, who became the love of his life. Um, this is a picture of them on the side here. They both co-starred um, in a play uh, in Pekin and uh, fell in love. Uh, and the rest was history uh, in so far as that. Uh, he... He did various jobs um, throughout town. Um, got He worked on a dredging barge for a while. He uh, had a position at Corn Products for a while, uh, and he even worked in the family bakery. And then something drew him uh, into politics and public service, and he got his start on the Pekin City Council. He ran for an open position against 47 other people and was the top vote getter. Can't imagine 47 people running for Pekin City Council today, um, but it was a very popular position back then, evidently. Um, and he, he was just, he felt very much at home in a position like that and knew that this was the type of service that was being called forth upon his life. Um, but he also had an appetite to make an influence at the national level. And so in uh, 19... 29, he decided that he was going to run for Congress in 1930, uh, and he was completely unknown in the field. Um, but he came very close to winning that election, um, especially for somebody who was so unknown. Um, but he didn't win. But because he did so well, he decided my future is not over with this. And he ran again in 1932, and he won. He spent um, nearly a decade and a half in Congress and enjoyed a great career there. Um, as you know, he eventually joined the Senate, and I'm going to tell you the story about how that happened. In 1947, uh, again, enjoying a wonderful career in Congress, his eyesight started to go bad. He describes this phenomenon of having cobwebs in his eyes. And he received some uh, consultations from uh, ophthalmologists, and they were uh, not positive 
Uh, many of them cautioned him that he could be on the verge of losing his eyesight and he panicked because he thought, if I can't see, then I can't read. And if I can't read, I can't do my job well. And if I can't do my job well, then, you know, what in the world am I doing here? So he decides in 1947 that he is not going to seek re-election in Congress. And um, lots of folks tried to convince him uh, to stay in, that they would make it work, um, but he refused. And uh, he immediately began a process of resting and retreating. And at one point, he goes to Johns Hopkins for what would be the final consultation, consultation on his eyesight. Uh, and the conclusion was that uh, the issue was starting in one of his eyes, and it was quickly affecting the other one. And if he didn't remove the first eye, then he would lose sight in both of them and he would be blind. This took him aback, and uh, he asked for some time to just think. Doctor leaves the room. Uh, Dirksen uh, assumes a posture of prayer, wherein he describes a voice that came to him that he should not undergo the surgery. And the doctor comes back in the room, and Dirksen um, graciously thanks him for his time and his expertise. And he says, look, I fully trust that the opinion that you're giving me is um, of the highest professional one. But I just had a conversation with the man upstairs, and we're just not going to do this. So he left and continued his rest and his retreat. He, um, he and his wife moved out to uh, a cottage on the East Coast for a little bit where I don't even think they had a telephone. And it wasn't very long after that that his eyesight started to return. Uh, and then it came back fully, and he never had any issues with it ever again. And to this day, nobody really knows for certain what was happening. But he felt that he was rejuvenated and that his political life wasn't over, that he needed to go back to Washington, but this time he was going to go back and join the Senate. And he ran in 1950 against an incumbent who was not just an incumbent, but he was the Senate majority leader. Uh, and Dirksen won. It would be the equivalent of a newcomer unseating uh, Senator Durbin after all of his years in service and with all of his power. Um, but, you know, that that hard work that he had um, dedicated his life to and that had been in existence throughout even the early days of his upbringing uh, led him to to where he eventually uh, arrived. Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite photos that I had to share because this is um, this is an iconic photo of Dirksen on election night in 1950, um, and it's the moment where uh, the the seat was announced in his favor. And one of the things that I love about this is that you know you've got the peak in times in the background, uh, and one of the gentlemen in this photo is. Uh, a great uncle of uh, two boys that I went to school with. And so feeling that hometown connection for me is something that is really, really powerful. And um, I, I think that when you feel close to somebody who did such great things, and we can all feel so close to Dirksen um, since we're all from central Illinois, it really makes, makes an impact. And so um, this photo really means a lot to me. Um, as was mentioned in my introduction, Dirksen's longest lasting legacy is that he was instrumental in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And um, I don't even think that, that I fully understood before I took the position as director of the Dirksen Center just how important he was to this initiative. And truly without Dirksen, um, I think that most historians can say quite conclusively that um, things would not have happened uh, the way that they happened. And in fact, he was so instrumental that, um, you know, Time Magazine uh, put him on their cover in June of 1964. And this is one of the uh, original copies of that magazine that we have in our archives. And um, you know, his rhetoric 
in this movement, I think was really, really powerful. And one of the things that he said over and over again when he would talk about the Civil Rights Act is that um, this was an idea whose time has come and stronger than all the armies in the world is an idea whose time has come. And this uh, phrase has become iconic to um, that movement in time. Um, in fact, there was a, a book just recently published about the Civil Rights Act that um, adopted this as its title. As you know, Dirksen had uh, a wonderful way with words. And um, in conclusion, I'm going to share with you some of my favorite Dirksen quotes and why I think they're so important. This one, I'm a man of fixed and unbending principles, the first of which is to be flexible at all times. Again, such a testament to his good nature and his good humor. This made him so approachable and so relatable. But what he's really trying to express here is that um, he felt an obligation to be open-minded about everything. Yes, he was principled, but he also reserved the right and the opportunity to grow and to change and to accept new information that might alter his position on an issue. And um, you know, this is something that I wish representatives today uh, felt they had the latitude to do. Um, I don't think that members of Congress are necessarily any less principled today than they were back then, but the political climate certainly does not allow for this type of attitude towards um, public policy and legislation. And um, I think that's that's a real shame because if not for um, Dirksen's uh, embracing this philosophy, a lot of the good work that he did just simply would not have been possible. This is something that he said in response to a reporter when asked why he was so supportive of the Civil Rights Act. And he's quoting uh, an old English poet by the name of John Donne. And he says, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. I am involved in mankind and whatever the skin, we are all involved in mankind. Equality of opportunity must prevail. Um, Dirksen's faith in this quote. I see glimmers of his um, idolizing Lincoln. Um, of course, Lincoln, um, you know, went through his own civil issues uh, of the day. And I think that Dirksen saw his role uh, in a position of power to advance what Lincoln had done for people in the United States who continued to lack the privilege and the opportunity um, that others did. Uh, but I also see um, Dirksen's mastery of words and his uh, ability to not just persuade, but inspire. And his rhetoric was so powerful and um, I think it really made an influence on the ultimate trajectory of the United States. And I just, I love this quote because um, I think it encapsulates so much about him and about the movement. And then finally, you know, again, Dirksen being from central Illinois um, is something that we can all embrace and be reflective of. I think that even if you're not from Pekin, you can see a little bit of yourself in somebody like Dirksen, and that's powerful to me. Um, and again, he never forgot where he came from, just like his mother. When he announced his candidacy for the US Senate, which was the final campaign for the US Senate, uh, he did so from Pekin, and he had this to say about his hometown. All the major decisions in my life have been made here. The inspiration which I received here from a saintly mother, 
a devoted family, steadfast friends, the constant faith of teachers who taught me, the inspiration I found here in church, and the atmosphere of a quiet and well-ordered community were the forces which helped fashion those decisions, and for these, I shall be eternally grateful. And that's the last slide. Um, again, an iconic photo. Um, we should all be so proud that um, we share the same roots as people like Dirksen, who were so influential. And I hope that you can be inspired, like I am inspired, uh, that anything is possible and that we all have the ability to make change and to do good things. How'd I do? A little over. <laughs> but I will take questions if if you want to reserve time for questions. Yes. Okay. Were you a sir? That's really cool. an example of that forth uh, to Washington to continue serving his country. And um, I would encourage you all uh, who have an interest in history uh, to pick up a copy of this. It's really, really good.